Emily, what struck you about, uh, like, t take us back. Well, Daisy's getting that set up. Like, uh, t take us back to the first time you, you found out there was going to be Helvetia in Fallout 76. <laughs> or that it was Ooh. about Appalachia broadly. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Either one. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, I think I expected, like, a little more... I think I expected it to be worse than it is. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's just in, I mean, like you know, sort of a poverty porn yeah. situation. Mm -hmm. And it, I know that the game developers have talked about not wanting to do that, um, which I don't think I don't think they they did. But it still is have you know it's kind of this like projection of all of the anxieties of late capitalism on to West Virginia, which um, I feel like the state gets a lot. <laughs> but someone really did their research. I mean, clearly they yeah. like went to all these locations and kind of repl replicated them really immaculately. Um, and it is cool, like the way the gamers have um, have just like taken upon themselves to go visit these places and um seems like it's spurred a real interest in West Virginia. So that's that's a benefit for sure. I know the like the early, early gamer community lore about Fallout seventy six was that it had all this like like a ton of press and all kinds of like pre-release packages and you could like sign up for extra gear and merchandise and blah blah and then it just like totally failed out and then the game kind of sucked too so a bunch of people spent yeah. a lot of money and then didn't get the payout um at the initial launch so it has but like, i hear it's better now <laughs> i hear it's better now also um and at the yeah Issues have yeah. been addressed and that it's better gameplay, but I just don't think they'll recover from that hump. But it's interesting. Who's in that, that, who's like... in that commercial? Oh, is it Idris Elba? Yes. Yeah, Idris Elba yeah, singing Country Roads. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -oh. yeah. yeah. Which is... I don't know if I saw that. <laughs> big deal. <laughs> He's a big yeah. star. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just fascinating, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think the original game had no NPCs and people were kind of complaining that it was boring. Yeah. Which is, like, one of the hallmarks of Fallout games, that there's just, like, a ton of NPCs. Yeah, a ton like, of great people ton. to talk to. Yeah. And, like, yeah, I don't know why. Anyway, it doesn't really matter, but um, I'm glad that it's changed now, and I'm glad that, since I haven't played it all the way through, I'm, it's encouraging to hear your take that it's not, like, just a total you know, poverty, like, expose of Appalachian, and it, it's actually trying to do something um, with that narrative, or at least flip it a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like um, this, like, something I write about is that it's almost this Tomorrow's People. So there was this book written about Appalachia um, in the early 20th century called Yesterday's People, and it was sort of about how you know, Appalachians are backwards and stuck in time. And there's almost this kind of like, oh, West Virginia, like, bears the brunt of, um, like, our societal excess and mm -hmm. environmental degradation and the, you know, capitalism. And it's almost like the fault or the Vault 76 are, like, supposed to be the best and brightest who are, you know, first out of the vault because they're there to solve the problems of the world. So... Um, it's almost like this flipping of the narrative for better, for worse. E, e yeah. Robinson in chat called it a great hate read. <laughs> nice. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, in that case, yes. should we go ahead and get started on this, on the formal piece of the interview? Oh. Yeah, let's okay, do it. Cool. Dom, um, maybe would you like to do the honor since <gasps> you are not what? the host today? You're the mod? We have, yeah, let's we, see. we have to do something first, and then we'll jump in. Let's see if I remember how to do this. No, I think I got it. All right. <laughs> it. Emily, hi. Uh, you know, you see you, Hello. see, you, you see me. You, you see you. You don't see you. Uh, you see me. You see, see me. Daisy. Uh, you don't see we're... Daisy. You see me on Twitch. You see you. Uh, you, you see, see me. <laughs> you tell I'm really excited for Avatar 2. Emily, yeah. I see you. I see you. Uh, <laughs> 
Hi, you you see me and Daisy on the show. You see us asking you questions. Uh, but I would just like to remind you and chat that there's a whole team of uh, intrepid, <laughs> wonderful, and uh, I'm going to say uh, caffeinated uh, as my third adjective this yes. week, uh, folklorists <laughs> who help research the guests and put together these questions who we affectionately know as the Folkwise Interview Sleuths, uh, who I once called the Folkwise Internet Sleuths, but that's not, not wrong. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, the, they uh, spend their free time uh, researching the guests, putting together these questions with us and asking these wonderful questions. So if there's a question this week that makes you uh, smile or makes you go, that's a good question, or makes you laugh, don't thank <laughs> Daisy, don't thank me, thank the sleuths. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Daisy. Yeah. Um, so we, we start off with kind of a general question that we think fits a theme of a lot of different things that you study. Um, so how, Emily, does feminism get expressed in domestic spaces? Mm, that is a very good question. Um, well, ooh, hmm, how do we even oh, start? You can, ooh, thank you, you <laughs> narrow it to You can narrow it down to like things that are relevant to your work and research also, <laughs> that helps yeah um well i think one of the things so i wrote about this or like kind of explored this through a pie blog for a long time which sort of put to i put to rest in 2016 um but uh now or like more recently i've been writing about women non-professional women songwriters and um i specifically worked with four in west virginia one who is like a labor songwriter, um, another who did, well, she did um, a lot of con- country music in as a teenager, um, but that was kind of a secret. She like wrote all these gospel songs and performed in a gospel quartet with her husband and another couple, and they traveled all over like rural West Virginia singing these original and then like traditional gospel tunes. Um, but her her granddaughter um, ended up finding these tapes of hers um, from when she was like a teenager and in her early twenties. And there are all these like lonesome housewife kind of um, songs. And you can hear her like kids uh, playing in the background of these tapes. And they're just so incredible. And it's just something that was seemed to be like a personal practice that was not something her husband knew about or her family knew about. Um, And a lot of it is like about her relationship and about being a mother and um, like about discontentment and being lonesome and um, like dealing with the pressures of uh, being a housewife and uh, domesticity and all that. Um, So that is something I've, I guess I've been really interested in the way, like historically and in some, um, you know, different cultures, um, women find a way to express themselves and um, empower themselves through like creative practices, whether it's pie making or songwriting um, in ways that are acceptable in their culture. So writing or playing music might have been, um, accepted or baking a pie, um, or making a quilt, but then women find ways to kind of subvert that. So there's like, I think in the feminist messages book, there's that chapter about, um, the quilt of Sunbonnet Sue, yes, uh, which is like I, the classic quilt. Yeah. Um, I'm a huge, yeah. <laughs> uh, quilter too. So I, I love you. Yes, right, yeah. Right. I love quilting. Yes. Um, Yes, and Dom post the link to Feminist Messages, and if you can find that article on quilting, that would be cool. If not, I'll post it in our Discord, because the subversion! Anyway, you're about to go off yes, about this, yes. please. <laughs> well, there's, there's, like, this quilt that I think a collective of, of women quilt makers got together, and they did this quilt that I think is Death to Sunbonnet Sue. Yeah. So Sunbonnet Sue is, like, you you probably have seen the image. It's, like, a per, you know, a girl in a bonnet. Mm-hmm. And there's no face. It's just like this huge bonnet. And, you, yeah. you know, it's like a classic Americana image. And then this quilt, Death to Some Bonnet Sue, is like her offing herself or like <laughs> jumping in the right. river or like, yeah, all the different yeah. ways um, like Sun Bonnet Sue could be murdered. Um, yeah. And Sun Bonnet Sue kind of then represents these, you know, like classic femininity and gender norms and all of this. Um, so yeah, that's one example of some sub- subversive yeah. domestic feminism. 
Um, wait, for oh, the Twitch sorry. auto mod uh, who is watching, uh, Emily, uh, Emily legally <laughs> said, uh, uh, <laughs> self forever box. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Did I say something wrong? No, we, no, we're, no. no, we're just joking because like people have to change. You can't say to end lives of the self. It's kind of game of like... find creative ways to describe ending lives. I see, I see. Yeah, so yeah. Like, which is its own kind of interesting <laughs> subversion also, which is fun. But um, we kind of have a follow-up to this that I I want to bring up just because it's a, a phrase that you've created. Um, how is home, like the space of home or the concept of home, important for constructing what you call a purposeful domesticity? Hmm. Do I call it that? Sleuths? Yeah, when we looked this up. <laughs> I was just I was just taken from like a uh this was I'm trying to find exactly where we have it in our notes, but there was you were talking one? about you were talking about a purposeful domesticity, like the intentionality of making the home as a kind of feminist act, even though it's part of it can be a subversion just as much of a place of of entrapment i guess is the mm-hmm, kind of duality mm-hmm. yeah. that you're describing yeah. where there's the domesticity is one thing but the purposeful domesticity relating to the home yeah yeah mm-hmm. so like in with my record label spinster we put out a record by um this songwriter lou turner who lives in nashville and she, um, her latest record is all about, it was, you know, she was at home during COVID and kind of like in this, these little world, discovering these little worlds within her home. Um, so like sitting in the backyard and observing something or um, making something in her kitchen and writing a song about it. And she was kind of playing with this idea of what does it mean to be a troubadour like in a fixed space of home Um, because there's all these like the masculine like on the road um, archetype of the rambler gambler who blows through town and like loves and leaves and she was thinking okay like what is the equivalent of that within a fixed environment of home and space and how can I find how can I discover new worlds Mm -hmm. within my home like while I'm while I'm confined during COVID but Mm -hmm. just generally um and she introduced me to this book um it's a a feminist epic or like a domestic feminist epic midwinter day um by I think Bernadette Mayer um it's like a 70s um piece of feminist poetry um but she is kind of writing this epic um within the context of a day of like picking up her kids from school and um going home and making dinner and uh, how can you like how could that be a place of discovery um and purpose um even though you're not you know out on the road and shaking things up and um you know finding discovery new territory or whatever the kind of like westward expansion masculine sure, archetype sure. is yeah yeah um for this next question i'm so glad that your brain is already going <laughs> you already brought up some things that we're gonna ask you like follow up or like deeper questions about and one of them is about pie um right we... right <laughs> good good <laughs> um so we wanted to know why Pi is one of your gateways to exploring the depth and breadth of traditional informal culture or folklore. Why is Pi so good at being this kind of avenue for all of the different things that might encompass folklore? Daisy, you could have stopped yeah. it. Why is Pi so good? Why is Pi good? <laughs> Emily, why is Pi so good? Yes. <laughs> why is Pi good for thinking? <laughs> First of all, because everybody loves it, right? Yes. Um, yeah, so that's right there you're like okay folklore can be fun it can be delicious and Mm -hmm. everyone has some kind of relationship to it um but then uh yeah i think it's a really good example because there's so many regional variations um that are about place so um like in indiana there's hoosier cream pie and (laughs) <laughs> in West Virginia, you might get into like some savory ramp pies, um, you know, maybe like a quiche, quiche sort of thing. Um, 
persimmons, also Indiana, um, but kind of, you know, North Carolina, um, rhubarb, you know, all these, all these kind of like seasonal um, ingredients that have developed all these regional variants. So there's that place-based aspect. Um, there's the community aspect. So community, um, you know, pie is a food that you don't really eat at, eat alone. It's like, yeah. it's not a cupcake. Yep. Um, you can eat a slice of pie and then you, you know, maybe you could eat a whole pie. Um, <laughs> Dom could probably eat a whole pie, yeah. but, um, we could eat pie. cream pie. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I don't know. It's so rich. Um, but you know, it yeah. invites this kind of like communal, um, Hot you know, sitting together things. and yeah, yeah, like cutting a piece of pie. Um, so it's not an individual food. It doesn't keep that well. So yeah, it's something you should share with other people. Um, and what else? There's I've thought about this so much. It's like <laughs> I mean, you're, you're making me think now that I'm thinking deeply alongside you about the pie and folk art. Like the creativity you can put into the crust. Right. The yes. Like, yes. Both the recipe, which we already talked about, but just like the art you can put on top of the pie is pretty cool, depending mm -hmm. on the kind mm -hmm. of pie. You yes. Make. Totally. There's like this um, artful creative aspect to it and then then you could get into like if you do a butter crust or a crisco mm -hmm. crust or a lard crust mm -hmm. um and everyone has their own preferences about you know which is the best mm -hmm. um the way to do it correctly there's also like often a pie person yes. like in a family oh. or in a mm -hmm. a town um you know there's like the person who is really good at making pie and you can count on, we'll bring it to Thanksgiving or, um, you know, a family dinner or a potluck. I just, and I guess go ahead. in the chat, Joel Chapening specifically said my aunt Beth's blueberry pie. And then is going on about the pie getting entered in the Ohio state fair and the, wow. <laughs> the judge. So it's perfect that you said that. Cause we already oh, got an the example last part, Daisy. it. Gotta Sorry. say the last part. Oh, oh, just, <laughs> uh, my Aunt Beth enters her pies at the Ohio State Fair every year and calls anyone who beats her and the judges pie bitches. <laughs> nice, nice. So the pie bitches, they go down. We want, yes. we want Aunt Beth's blueberry pie only. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Um, yeah, so I think, but it, it, this is not like a... Um, a formal standard it's like a community standard of mm -hmm. like we recognize that aunt beth is the pie person yes um and that is very folkloric yeah absolutely yeah great answer <laughs> the, yeah <laughs> pick a food way and just go into it for thinking of yes. all the different ways it, it relates to the communities and the creativity in your everyday life totally yeah yeah um and i got a next question here in an okay. interview with Cordella Magazine, you described thinking of traditional music as, quote, inherently weird and experimental. How is that value reflected in Spinster Sounds? Wow, these sleuths really went deep. <laughs> you have a lot of great content on the internet, Emily. Oh, yeah. You made Actually, it if easy. I can, if I can share this, the sleuths were overwhelmed by how much they found <laughs> Some people are hard to sleep, but you have so many, you've like done so many little comments and like side interviews and publications and like, it's very cool. Too. It's a big book one label. too. Yeah, book, book, I feel book a little too seen, but no, I really appreciate <laughs> yeah. the questions. Um, yeah. So um, with Spinster, we don't like, I think for a while, um, you know, when I was pitching press, they're like trying to figure out what genre we like do dwelled in because a lot of labels have like a specific genre so it's like americana or folk or whatever mm -hmm. um and we i mean i was a college radio dj and like did freeform radio um so i'm into all kinds of different genres of music um but i think some of the weirdest music i've ever heard and i like weird music like noise and experimental oh, me stuff too. And, like, i also like weird just music. you know like yes. banging on a gong <laughs> you know for an hour um we should so <laughs> we should just 
make a music podcast that's just weird noises and just yes a music podcast i'm into it i like this totally yes. and <laughs> sounds you know like weird sounds yes um but but some of the weirdest music i've ever heard is like traditional folk music like super scratchy fiddle that has three parts and you know one of the parts never repeats itself and it's like off time um and it's crooked um you know so we were really into that and i think i have an aversion to like when folk music gets too smoothed out like some of the the americana or like the emo americana yeah. <laughs> yes. um, uh, emo and americana um so yeah we we are all like really into folk music but the weirder side of it um and wanted to kind of acknowledge all our different interests of music so there's there's definitely like a sound we're interested in but that sound is not confined by a specific genre so we have someone like yasmin williams who's playing um like finger style guitar but is inspired by go-go music um and grew up listening to like earth wind and fire right. and started playing <laughs> guitar because she was into guitar hero um and then you know more singer songwriters and rock musicians and then a, bit, a band like slut pill um that's like a real girls rock kind of um like punky um punky like hard rock band um so we wanted and all the you know all those slut pill musicians are they're traditional musicians as well they play you know east kentucky fiddle tunes um so we wanted to kind of bridge those connections through the artists we support and now we're putting out this um this record of it's a husband and wife duo who play like carnatic um south indian classical music combined with like western chamber music and jazz improvisation and like some folk idioms so I, yeah i don't know it's it's kind of we've like found a little corner of the music world of artists who who make those connections already i'm like that's a lot of words i can't imagine coming together <laughs> to <laughs> sound. i we gotta somebody we gotta listen to this that's why I'm, yeah um, so yeah cool. it's very cool yeah do you have like a suggestion for where to listen to something like that like do we go to spend yeah time? um yeah so we you can just look on our band camp okay. um i think it's cool. minster sounds dot band camp dot cool, com cool. and that record's not out yet, but they have one track up. Um, nice. It's pretty drony and cool. Yeah. Sweet. Okay, I've got another serious question for you, and then I got a couple funsy questions. Are you ready? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. As a public folklorist, how is how does being a generalist grant you the flexibility and positionality to meet communities' needs? Mm. It's kind of a big question. Also, that is also a very good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons I was drawn to folklore is because I feel like a generalist and I have lots of different interests and would always go back and forth between like music and and food often pie um <laughs> but um but yeah and like to find these connections between different genres um and they are all under folklore's umbrella which I think is very cool and one of my you know main attractions to the field um, but yeah, you can definitely see that in the way communities engage with expressive culture, like, um, you know, the, the square dance, um, well, yeah, so I guess I'll take a step back. Um, so I think of traditional music as being participatory, um, it's community based, it's not necessarily or not usually there's no distance between like the people playing music and the people there enjoying the music. Um, the people enjoying the music are part of it too. So take like a square dance or an old time jam. Um, if you're not playing music, you're dancing or you're tapping your foot, or maybe you brought a pie to the square dance. Um, maybe you're taking tickets at the door. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe someone is selling their quilts or their, you know, their crafts. Um, on the side and it's all part of a community expression like creative expression so 
I don't think communities separate these disciplines of like, oh, this is music and this is um, this is dance and this is um, craft um, and this is food ways, but it's actually the way that communities experience them are as part of a whole kind of holistic um, multi-genre event. Um, and so I think being a generalist and being able to see that and being interested in all of those different aspects and seeing them as kind of like um, inseparable um, is an important uh, approach for a folklorist. What do you see as visionary folklore? Yeah, so this is the the last chapter, the conclusion of my book and kind of the way I tie things together. Um, so I think I saw Barbara Christianblatt Gimblet Gimblet talk about BKG. Yeah. I'll just say that. The notorious. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was at some kind of AFS uh webinar during the peak of COVID and she was talking about this idea of anticipatory heritage and I was like this is what I've been writing about um but I think it's a little bit different so she's she was sort of writing about um folklorists being able to anticipate what will become you know the traditions um in the future or like anticipate what will be historic and I think she was specifically thinking about that during COVID and like documenting altars and the way um, in protests and um, the way people were memorializing those um, who had died and um, visionary folklore and she, so she talks about anticipatory folklore as having like recourse to the present um, and then visionary folklore is like having recourse to the future so having like a future focus framework um, when we think about folklore. So I was thinking about the way we we engage with the past and traditions that manifest into the present, um, but really thinking about and learning from communities um, about how we need to advocate for the future of these traditions. So um, when we do field work, asking things like what is your ideal future for this art form that you practice and what needs to be in place for that future to be realized. Um, and then as a public folklorist thinking about, okay, how can I help that future to be realized? How can I help put these things in place? So this future, so this tradition can not only be sustained, but have its, you know, like best future life for the next generation. So that was something I was learning from communities. Um, they were already doing it. But um, it's like a temporal shift to think about the future rather than the present and the past. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Don, if you haven't done so already, you got to plug the book because this is very important. Everybody needs to read this book. <laughs> oh, and uh, keep an eye on our ads if you want to. If you if you're gonna miss this link now, there'll there'll be something up later. But that yeah, I think that that's true. So much of what people understand or think of, they hear folklore for the first time and they immediately think about the past. And it's so cool <laughs> to Brit the way that you have brought in this like, a, a, like a sample or like a way of thinking or like a, a, the perspective of like the modern folklorist is fixated in this future or like advocacy for our communities to make them sustainable, long lasting, you know, make them better in the ways that they want to, they like, the, I, I don't know, this is my like ecology brain, it's like, it's like a mushroom, it's like going towards the nutrients, <laughs> and the nutrients are just out of reach, and we're like form fitting to the different areas, and like folklorists are really good at finding the things, or at least helping advocate on behalf of communities to institutions to get them to the resources that will help make them stronger and like sustainable and continue. Um, so I think that you lay that out really yeah. well uh, in your book. That's great. Thanks. Thank yeah, and also just like realizing the um, the gaps within institutions. So how can we mm -hmm. we shape our institutions to better suit the needs of yeah. the people we work with? Absolutely. That's something I'm still working on. It's hard. Probably be yeah. a lifelong project. <laughs> Probably. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um, 
Emily, are you ready to, for some more <laughs> lighthearted, funsy questions? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, why does Mothman have such a long-standing and international appeal? Is Mothman sexier than Bill Withers? Oh, Is there two questions? I don't know. Bill Withers. <laughs> I think so, that's... I don't in West think... Virginia, it's a two-point West... right? West <laughs> Virginia. <laughs> I don't think you could compete with Bill Withers. <laughs> very fair. I don't know. Fair. Does Moth? I mean, if Moth... maybe if Mothman sang, I don't know. Ooh. Or if there Mothman some... wrote "Ain't No Sunshine." Like, come Good. on. I mean, good point. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Moth... yeah Bill, I... Bill Withers could collapse a bridge, but Mothman couldn't do "Use Me." <laughs> <laughs> it's so fascinating that, like, when I feel like a lot of people they hear West Virginia and they think Mothman first. Like, that's so interesting globally that that's happened, like, in the, mostly in the 21st yeah. century. Yeah, totally. I mean, the, um, is this at the Mothman Museum? Maybe it's at the Flatwood Monster Museum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but they have some Mothman stuff, too, and uh, there's, well, maybe that's, I don't know. Anyway, there, those, uh, both of those cryptids are, like, really um celebrated like in japan with all these figurines and yeah. um yeah it's like there's a cult following but i don't know i mean i do think there is something that um yeah Moth mothman just uh hits on something universal i yeah. think wild wonderful west virginia as they say and i think there's been a yeah this like yeah. embrace of um, mothman as being um benevolent yeah. lately yes yeah. Uh, when maybe that wasn't the case. Yeah, before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I got another one for you. <laughs> What's the pie that you always bring to the party? Or do you like to shake it up? Do I do like to shake it up. Um, like, my family requests cranberry chest pie the most. Um, Whoa! That's, that's good. Sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a that's a Hoosier mama pie um that that's a shop in Chicago but she's from Indiana but that's, that's her awesome. recipe um Can you and it is chest pie for the people? Yeah, for yes <laughs> so chest pie is um it's like a curd so chest pie people think it's like the southern dialect of like just pie but i think where it really came from is um you know, cheese, any kind of curd was called cheese at one point. Um, so chess pie is sort of like cheese pie. Oh, sure. I think that's where it wow. comes from. But it's basically butter, sugar, flour, and eggs. Um, so it's super custardy and thick. Mm -hmm. And then when you add the cranberries in, there's like that tart crunchiness. Like a pop. And then with the like buttery, yeah. it, I mean, it's, I, it's the perfectly balanced pie. The that was, I, that I, was the, audit, the audible say, reaction yeah. I had when I figured out what the cranberries would be good doing. Like, I was oh. like, whoa. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it's pretty perfect. They have a lot of chess yeah. pie in Cincinnati. That's where I mm, had a lot yeah. of chess pie. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, like uh, just a straight chess pie or mm -hmm. chocolate chess or lemon chess. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, Dom, I think, has to ask this next one because Dom knows this show much more than I do. Oh, barely. Okay, we're gonna <laughs> we're more. gonna we're gonna play pretend. We're gonna play pretend here, Ellen. You ready? Okay. Okay. Hi. Uh, I, I am I'm Dom Tartaglia. This is Daisy Allstone, and we are the uh, CEOs of NBC. <laughs> and uh, we hear that you have a uh, a bold idea for a new TV show that, that you wanted to pitch to us. So explain to us uh, your pitch for a, a reboot of Columbo for Peacock. <laughs> Columbo. Are you just, is this just because these sleuths know that I love Columbo? Yes. It could be. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. See, that is so hard because like, how can you do Columbo without Peter Falk? Fair. Well, I just like, he's so charming and, I just don't know. As, I just don't know if you could re redo it. As one of the uh, CEOs of NBC, I will look into the various forms of payment required, necromancy, the oh, things I was that you just carry Fisher back to life, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, like, yeah, 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 I will do. I will do the computer. <laughs> <laughs> we can. We can uh, figure this out. It seems like it will work. Yeah, I think that would be great. Like, maybe you could also do some, um, 
you know, you could take some footage from Princess Bride where he's a grandfather. Like oh, maybe yes. you could work. Yeah. Yeah, we could um, like work some of that. Like we could like CGI some of that. Into yeah, the some new... of the like Cassavetes <laughs> movies he's in. You could mm-hmm. like. Yeah, you can make it work. The chat so knows. If we're, not, if we're not gonna, chat knows oh, go cheap, Daisy, go Daisy. Uh, the chat knows a cheap necromancer, so they say. Thank oh, you. Um, great. S- Hi, S- S- SRGV twelve. Uh, <laughs> right in, oh, I think so it's good to I know. Just, Thanks. Like railroad the chat's idea. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> outside of necromancy and yeah. and uh and, and i don't know postmodern hellscape of bringing them back through a deep fake um what is like the uh like the eternal appeal of colombo for you um well he, there's definitely like a class thing going on so often it's like there's a like in the cast of the one where cassavetes plays like a conductor um and is the murderer like colombo only arrests rich people Mm, um, mm-hmm. Like he, there's really like he's I I truly think that Columbo and Sid Hatfield are like the only good cops, um, <laughs> and yeah. Columbo is like not even really a cop. Like he wears this trench coat. He drives a like, French car. Like, um, like justice. A, yes, like yeah. he only works like in L.A. with these rich people that like kill their wives or their mistresses or, um, you know, their husbands yeah. or someone who's you know. A political rival or whatever right. so and the whole thing is like they underestimate him because he's like this working class guy working class italian and he like mm-hmm. pulls hard-boiled eggs out of his you know trench coat pocket and eats what it a powerful move yeah. i know it's yeah, so cool. <laughs> so um cool. <laughs> and he's always like you know my my wife's getting into classical music you know he, or like i'm learning about chess and the chess master is like yeah right like you yeah you like working class dumb guy yeah um and then he just like gets them every time so it's it's so formulaic in a way that it's very comforting but it's just so great to see these like rich jerks go down hell yeah i think my all-time favorite <laughs> dolly that, mini what you, you know you know like oh, the, the dolly, dolly me oh okay yeah the like dolly me ai generated images yes yeah i think my all-time favorite one of those someone did colombo amiibo and all of like the oh. ai generated colombo figurines were so good looking they were really funny. what's amiibo oh like the did... these things behind me like the nintendo figurines yeah like the little figurines okay, you can okay. like put uh-huh, it's like they're uh-huh. called amiibos and so it's like a Got basically, it. basically like a little action figure yes <laughs> that's nice. awesome They've got uploadable data in them for your game. Yeah. Uh, I have one, one more funsy question for you, and then we have a very low stakes game to play together that I think I actually am going to make you Dom. Now. I'm going to make Dom maybe host that because it's. I would love to, Daisy. I was going to say, like, I think it's only right if I pass that to you. But anyway, Emily, what is your favorite line of cut print you've ever done for your seasonal winter solstice cards? Mm. Also a very nice and deep question. <laughs> I feel like a little creeped out. Uh, it's just it's just, it's, 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 it's the sleuths. It's us. Totally not something available on Twitter at all. Definitely not. <laughs> well, I I think my favorite was the one that was like most the biggest one and most extensive, but um I did one in 2020 that was an incredible string band quote. Um, that I think everyone thinks is like some, some like ancient Scottish saying, but I think the incredible string band just made it up. Um, <laughs> but it's in one of their songs and it's may the long time sun shine upon you, all good surround you and the pure light within you guide your way on. So That's it's, awesome. a, you know, it's yeah. like of oh, that text and like someone was joking with me that I made. I essentially made like a live, laugh, love. Like, fair enough. But, it's you know, like it was work. at a time. <laughs> yeah. But I bet it sounds great in Gaelic. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah it probably yeah. sounds so cool. <laughs> <laughs> but it is like a little blessing in a time we needed, a, you know, a, yeah. some, some good thoughts. But yeah, Absolutely. it is also kind of a live, laugh, love situation. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, thank you for your awesome and thoughtful answers to all those questions. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna thank you, up. sleuths. Yeah, thanks, thank you, sleuths. I'm gonna. Oh, thanks for the bits, chat. Yeah, thanks for the bits. Um, I'm gonna. I just close the chat. 
Oh, that's okay. I'm gonna queue up um the game really quick, and I Don, okay. why don't you do the honors of explaining this? I'm just gonna oh, sh- I, I'm gonna share screen. I am to ready you. this week. I feel I feel like we you know, uh, <laughs> we're come we're come to the Folkwise Studio. Vibing. We're vibing. <laughs> Uh, watch stream if you haven't yet, uh, yeah. Emily. But the big question for you: Have you ever made a tier list? No. Uh, Good. <laughs> You're yeah. in luck. Or chat are not familiar with tier lists. A tier list uh, comes from fighting game as a way. Fighting games as a way to rank character choice. Uh, okay. And usually happen on a scale from uh, S to D. S being a grade above 100, superior, and D being barely passing. Uh, you know, like I said, the, this is normally uh, uh, this started off as a way to rank uh, character choice in video games, and it has since evolved, especially on Twitch, into being a way to rank things in everyday life, uh, which we love as folklorists because we love talking about everyday life. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. To do a tier list with the guest about something that they are the expert on, and <laughs> today for you. <laughs> We have the best hot dog joints in West Virginia tier list. This is going to get me in trouble. I know oh it's going to get in trouble. So this is why we had a disclaimer we in the discla- final There's a disclaimer. From the chapter, the- Friends of Coleslaw and Emily Hilliard's book, Making Our Future. This is not an exhaustive list of hot dog joints <laughs> in West Virginia. This is just 11 of the author's cool spots. They're the ones great, on the map. Great. Perfect. And if you get mad on Twitter about this, she will ratio you. So and I, you I, I just assume that you are going to just you, you are gonna quote have- tweet someone and own them if they get actually get mad. We just love uh, an like eleven and nine. You know, they give you a normal distribution if you do it right. We're not <laughs> yeah. trying to pick every single. You don't have like, to do it that way. In West Virginia chat. <laughs> there's too many hot dogs in West there's Virginia. There's too much out there. There um, is. There's like three hundred at least. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you'll put eleven on a map. I thought it was a very cool looking infographic. <laughs> it is not a list, and uh, cool. and yeah, get ready to get ready to get dogpiled by both uh, <laughs> uh, K underscore M Hilly and uh, Folkwise thirteen. If, if you right. think that we are yeah. actually ranking every single uh, uh, one and, and leaving your best out, if you're in yeah. chat right now, or if you're watching this on YouTube uh, <laughs> later, hi, and you have. Uh, another hot dog joint. Post about it. Let us know. Yes. If you please. get if you get bad, we will Tell us. kill you. <laughs> so right. I, you know, uh... as one hot dog stole to another, I I felt very uh very uh seen by this chapter. Very yes. Important. Yes. This good. I'm glad. yes. <laughs> Yeah, Glizzy Tour 2020 chat is doing. So let's let's get on let's get on the Glizzy Express through West Virginia. And uh, what is Glizzy? Oh, uh, Glizzy God. actually a little further east is slang for hot dog. That's like Virginia and Maryland slang for mm, hot dog. Never heard that. Oh, you never heard Glizzy? No. That's good. Now, yes. Dang. Yeah, this is good. We talk about this though. This is good. <laughs> All right, oh uh, so gosh, I've got I got a list of all these. They might be a little small for you to see, but uh, I, I will we'll, tell you what's we'll what. Off, yeah. Daisy will click on one. I will tell you what's what. If you would like to tell us a little bit about uh, this hot dog spot, and you can rank it on a scale from S to D. You can, oh, you but can how really, silly of me. Okay, remind me, okay, remind me how I'm ranking these again. You uh, literally on whatever metric you come up with <laughs> we have s is the best d is the the worst you can put them wherever you want and it stacks uh, horizontally and vertically so okay, like you cool. can put multiple things in one category if you want okay cool and yeah. if people if people don't know why are we talking about hot dogs in west virginia what's special about them yes so a, a west virginia hot dog is typically slaw chili slaw mustard and onions um, but maybe not slaw if you're above the slaw line. Yeah. And usually oh. a steam bun. Um, it's like the Mason Dixon of condiments uh, that runs <laughs> through the state. Um, and just, the, you know, people have really strong opinions about their hot dogs in West yeah. Virginia. And the, you know, the story of it coming to the state is all tied up with immigration and labor. Um, and it's a cheap filling, yeah. delicious food. Heck yeah. Hell yeah. First up, Broadway Sandwich Shop. Yeah, first up is Broadway Sandwich Shop. Broadway. So Broadway uh, was opened by a Greek immigrant in Parkersburg, and it's still run by a family member. Um, And it was across from a high school and some factories, which is why they thought it um, it, uh, took hold, I guess, because, Mm. you know, it was a quick lunch during shifts or between shifts 
Um, but you know, I, I'm going to take one from the book of the Twitter people who got mad about my, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the hot dogs they said that so maybe the Broadway, the they said that maybe the Broadway has slipped a little bit. I haven't oh actually gosh. been there. I just talked to the family members and I don't want to upset the Val- Valoses in any way because they were very wonderful. Um, but I'm going to give it a B. Okay. Nice. Solid. This Good. is a solid start. Also, this you can change this as you go along too. If you discover that like yeah. you've placed okay. something somewhere you don't want to, you can go back okay. and change it. Yeah. Cool. Next up, we got Buddy Bees. Buddy Bees is a little country store outside of Sissonville, West Virginia. Um, they have all kinds of you know. You can get your seeds. You can get your sodas, your candy, and you can also get hot dogs. And they have the most amazing sign. I was just gonna say um, yes. this, we have to talk about the sign for yes. Excellent. I think it says "Best in Town Hot Dogs" in the center, but then it's everything else that they sell there. So it's like soup beans, seeds, meats, cheeses, hot, hot foods. candies, hot foods. Yeah, yeah. it's like a it's Walt beautiful. Whitman poem. Yeah, <laughs> it really it is. is. So I'm gonna have to give that an A. Yeah, just for the yeah. sign alone. It's so good. The sign. It's uh, hand painted. Also, I don't think we. Yes, that. but yeah, it's like it's a just hand painted really sign. Beautiful. It's awesome. We love. Someday I'm gonna do. Sign. Yeah, there are actually so many good signs in West Virginia. Someday I'm gonna do a little zine of signs of West Virginia and Buddy nice. Bees. Be Might so have to cool. be the cover. Yeah, That'll exactly. So cool. Except oh. there was another country store sign I saw once that said. We now have some produce. That's awesome. <laughs> it was so good. That's awesome. And it was just like a lone head of cabbage. Heck yeah. Yeah, like a few awesome. apples. Yeah. Banana. Just just enough. Just what you need. Just some. Yeah. That's awesome. Next up is Chums. Chums. So Chums is very unique because it has a yellow slaw. Ooh. So it's heavy on the mustard. Yeah. yeah. Um but I have to say, I th- I'm more partial to the regular slaw because I think it cuts the sweetness of the, you know, the white slaw that's more mayonnaise based cuts mm-hmm. the spice of the chili better. Mm-hmm. So maybe I'll put it, I'll give Chums a B. Ooh, above or below Broadway? Mm, can I, uh, maybe above. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Cool, yeah. cool. For okay. the moment, for the moment. <laughs> yes, for now. Next up is Jay's Grocery. Jay's. So Jay's is no longer selling food, but it was in the southern uh, coal fields of West Virginia, and it was the it was a gas station convenience store, an alteration shop, the post office, and a hot dog joint. Do it all. Damn. Yeah. I know. She also did like hand hand rolled biscuits. Um, but Jay's w- had an amazing hot dog. It was just like perfection, and she would make this the slaw to order, um, depending on like how saucy I guess, how mayonnaise-y you liked it. Yeah, or, yeah, and then they also did like the English bun. Uh, you know, like what a lobster roll comes in. Oh, right, yep, yep. Like the right. split bun. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I will give. I'll. I will give. J's an S, but they oh, might have to be yeah. behind another S because they're no longer selling food. That, that's a good teaser. That's, that's a good fair teaser. and yeah. yeah, fair and a very good yep. teaser. Yes. <laughs> uh, next up is King Tut. King Tut is an awesome drive-in. Another amazing sign in Beckley. Um, they have pies, liver and onions, um, all kinds of like, you know, meatloaf, meatloaf sandwiches. Classic drive-in. Um, hot dog was hot dog was pretty good. Um, and I talked to the owner, who was super sweet. I'm gonna give that an A behind Buddy Bees. Nice, nice, nice. Very good. Uh, we love it. But drive-in. also, if you're if you're ever on the you know West Virginia interstate, stop in Beckley, go to King Tut. Will do. Next up is Kirk's. Kirk's also closed now. Yeah. I learned from this Twitter. Uh, <laughs> this debacle. powerful t- Twitter 
explosion of conversation about hot dogs. Yes. Twitter was outside of Hinton. Or, uh, sorry. Kirk's was outside of Hinton. <laughs> right next to the Dairy Queen. Um, right on the river there. Um, Kirk's was all right. I will give it... Let's see. What do we have? We have... What do we have in the B category? We, we have the Broadway. The Broadway. And we have Chums. And Chums. Mm-hmm. Um... I will put it B, the front of B. Nice. Right there? Yeah. There. Yeah. There? Uh Great. Nice. Uh Nice. I believe next up is Morrison's. Morrison's is a really great dog. It's in Logan. Also a drive-in. Their sign at the front of their building says this kind of like inscrutable chicken in the fingers in the box to go. Um, oh, it's like this old sign. It's like chicken, <laughs> chicken in the fingers. Oh, <laughs> very oh. interesting uh, turn of phrase there. Yes. Um, but yeah, they have a really good kind of classic West Virginia hot dog. Um, I will give it. I think it's an A in front of uh, in front of Buddy Bees. Let's go. Nice. I spent the summer in Logan. What? Senior year of high school. I spent a, like a, a whole summer. A, no, like oh. what, three weeks or something? Cool. That's, what were you yeah. doing? It was like my I went to Catholic school. It was like my senior like service mission and I like uh worked at like a after like a summer break like uh camp, you know? I I played with kids all yeah. summer. Nice. I thought you were gonna tell me you worked at the hot dog place. I wish. I wish <laughs> you I worked at more those chicken in the fingers. <laughs> I wish. Chicken in the fingers. Up next. All right. Next up, the Parkway Drive-In. Parkway also in Logan. Um, it's by the park. Parkway. That's oh, yeah. also, Good. also yes. cool sign of like a little bellhop. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Um, I would say the Morrison's dog is better though. Wait, what do we have after Buddy Bee's? In the we've in the A the category, other, we've got the other drive-in. King Tut is King after Buddy. Oh, King Tut, King Tut. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Let's put it in the A category after King Tut. Let's go. Is that right here, or is that right? Yeah, that's right here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. There we go. Nice, nice. Should have three left, right? Three left. Cool. Three so left. next up is Skinnies. Oh, Skinnies! Skinnies also closed. See, there is a oh, no. rip again. Great precarity of, um, yeah, yeah, hot dog joints. Yeah. Hot dog joints um, and, like, small family-owned regional food restaurants. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's always so sad. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And Skinny's was, yeah, Josh Skinny and his mother owned the place. It's got a cool sign. I think maybe it was Josh when he was a little boy. It's, like, a little boy with a cap, ball cap on, maybe licking his lips or something. Um, yeah, it looks kind of like that at the very top of a, yeah, of the very tippy top of the sign. Yes, so Skinny's was just down the road from Buddy B's. It was a beloved hot dog joint outside of Charleston. Um, let's put it behind the parkway since it's no longer in operation. So in the A category, very yeah. Fair. Chat wants to know if uh, these closures were uh, due to COVID. No, I think, I think maybe like the skinnies. I think they both passed away. The skeins mm. passed away. Um, no, I don't think any of them were COVID. Well, Kirk's might have been COVID related. Got it. Because that was like a, in the in a tourist area. Mm-hmm. Maybe never sense. bounced back. Yeah. yeah. Home stretch. The last two we we got Tom's up next. Tom's. I have to say that Tom's dog was not good. Oh, Chat <laughs> oh. loves an opinion. In... Chat loves, Chat an loves opinion. a strong opinion. <laughs> so that was an Oak Hill. It might have been just because we were at, you know, it was a last stop on our hot dog, like oh, a day sure. of eating hot yeah. dogs. Hot dogs all day. Yeah, yeah you, you, you but... set yourself up. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, no, not, not having it. So it might not have been the dog itself, but I, I think maybe some people talked about this in the you know, in the Twitter comments, but Tom's, 
I would say I think we might have to go C. <gasps> Fair enough. All right, all right. It's yeah. it's the game. It's all in the game, yeah, right? It's all game. game. And last up is last up is Yans. Yans, Yan is Yans is beloved. It's above the slaw line, and Russell Yan was the owner. He passed away. Is that is that the picture we found? Probably, yeah. I can't so, yeah. quite see it. There's like a, an older gentleman in front of a sign that says hot dogs, and then I see no very slaw, no slaw, no slaw. <laughs> okay. And I think maybe he had a no ketchup sign too. But um, well, that's good advice anytime. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yes, but yeah, notoriously would kick you out if you asked for slaw. Um, Damn. And the chili, no slaw, but the chili is extremely spicy, so you don't have slaw to cut the spice with. Oh, um, that's but you do. Yeah. I'd recommend that it's still open, even though he he passed away. I think mm -hmm. his son is carrying it on. But um, chocolate milk. Oh. Um, he serves Ooh. chocolate milk, so you're supposed to get chocolate milk to cut the spice of the chili, and then Mr. B's potato chips. And I think a standard order, like the Yan's dog are, dogs are somehow a little smaller, so mm -hmm. a lot of people order three. Usually, oh, wow. like, two is a standard order, yeah. two hot dogs. Yan's, hot you order dogs. three. Uh, I'm going to have to, yeah, go uh, ahead. Three hot dogs, a tall pint of chocolate milk, and some potato chips. Sounds mm -hmm. good. Good mm -hmm. order. Uh, Sounds great. Three, three cheese conies, one uh, extreme jalapeno cheese, and a regular five-way. What are we asking? <laughs> Where does this go on our two list? I think we put it behind in S, but behind the other. Oh. Behind. Behind Jason. Yeah, first Just like, because I will... Like, up at S for I... now, and here we are. <laughs> I think just because it's... It's not quite the classic with no slaw, you know? It's yeah, right. What would happen if you picked a, like, top of S tier above the slaw line? There, there would be right. I think, like, <sighs> people would, like, if you were from Fairmont, you would have to do that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, I think for me, my perspective is, that, you know, most dogs in West Virginia have slaw, and the slawless is more of a regional variation on that. Right. And I'm going to get in trouble for saying that too, probably. But if you are, if you're like from above the slaw line, you pretty much have to put Ian's first. Yeah. But, sure. you know, I think this is, this is the fair and responsible this ranking. Is, this looks pretty <laughs> solid. Again, um, these are <laughs> the 11 on the map of West Virginia um, hot dog places in Emily's book, Making Our Future. Uh, and Emily has now per both permission and encouragement, but also the entire team of folk lives behind you. If you ever get into Twitter, <laughs> thank you so much. Really in a funny folk lives, we got your back. It's not. It's not. Folk lives got your back. <laughs> this, I'm a little nervous. Okay. I think I think we can get through it. I think we can that's, get through it, right. folks. It's just it's hot dog joints. We know they're important. That's why we we study them. Okay. Yes. In um, a way, like that whole thing proves so my. Thesis. It's like right. people have strong opinions. Yeah, yeah. right. That's what yeah. I love about it. Yeah, it's <laughs> not none of, none of these are like bad at all. Like they're all just like different and interesting and cool and they're all experiential and like mm -hmm. you know, like and everywhere's gonna it's just like football. Everybody's gonna fight for their home team. It's like That's know, right. Every, everybody's gonna fight for their local hot dog joint. Um, and if you're yes. not fighting for your local hot dog joint, I highly recommend that you go down to that mom and pop restaurant that is there that you are very worried about with like yes. going out for some right. there's a there's a breakfast place called Jack and Benny's near me. I think about all the time. I can't really eat anything there, but I swear I'm so worried it's a diner that's gonna go that's gonna go away. I hope it does not. If you see a restaurant like that, if you see a food truck like that, but give them your money. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. I think to put a perfect pin yeah, on it, uh, like, S uh, SRGV12 in chat said, yeah. an opinion is boring if you don't offend at least a few people. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> you, they might call me a firebrand for agreeing with that, but I think I do. <laughs> yeah. At least a little bit. Yeah. I think that's true. Yeah. This is great. Dom, how can we summarize this list? We try to put a summary from S to C on hot dog. What's, uh, what, what, what was our how, top of S tier again? How, Who was that? Which which uh, hot dog joint is this at the top of S again? Yeah. 
It's not Broadway. Um, the, oh, the top is, put? is that Jay's? Jay's Grocery? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Jay's Grocery. Mm-hmm. Jay's Grocery yeah, is at the top. Jay's. Jay's Even grocery. though it's no longer, yeah, it's sad because it's no longer serving. But Yeah. Maybe you it's know, like. It's, it's up, it's, it's, it, it, Jay's, Jay's Grocery is just up in that big. It has ascended. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an angel. Jake so, in the sky. It has a yeah. little halo with a little hot dog sitting on it, kind of like the bun. <laughs> yes. Um, from, okay. I was going to say on a scale from S to C, how many of your hot dogs uh, has, how many hot dogs has Emily eaten in a day before she got to you? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> well, Jay's, I will say, Jay's was yeah. so good. Um, that was like, you know, one of the one of the last hot dogs of the day, and we were yeah. still really? really into it. But you know, we at this point we were like doing half dogs, and you know. yeah, right, sure. right. Yeah, fair, I mean, fair. this is Daisy. Daisy can relate to this because I made them. Eat all the Cincy chili in oh Cincinnati God, yeah. for a focus like video. Day, yeah. I, a I think a lot about hot dogs <laughs> professionally as well. Yes. Um. So I'm just glad we've got uh Another... we've got kindred spirits on 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 the stream this yeah, week. Yeah, hot dog Definitely. scholars for sure. Yes. Yeah. Next time, you know, we're at AFS. We got to find the hot dogs, the local hot dog. <gasps> that would be so fun. Portland, yeah, I'm gonna say Portland will have hot dogs, but they are definitely gonna be like hipster. They're gonna dogs. be like, yeah, <laughs> it's gonna for be, sure. Here's this, will, here's this carrot say... I've made taste like a hot dog. I promise it's gonna <laughs> taste just no. like sausage. Evil. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, I will say that I tasked uh, Pat Jarrett with finding me the best oh, burger yeah. in Tulsa this year, and he came through with something incredible. I did see him with like dripping bags of. <laughs> that was like, for me. <laughs> bean grease. Sauce. It was some kind of like double burger situation. That was oh double God. onion burger. That was for me. Yeah, the onion yeah. burgers. <laughs> double onion burger. He was very was excited. Awesome. It was Very really, cool. it was like eating that. I was like, oh, this is what a Big Mac is trying to be, you know? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. I did well, have a good um, hot dog in Bloomington with Betty Bellinas, um during the FOF conference. You at Naughty oh, that's Dog? That's awesome. Yes, yes. Oh, I love Naughty Dog. Yes. <laughs> Me and if you know, if you know the uh, ethnomusicologist uh, Rodrigo Ch- uh, Chicano, uh, recently of the Smithsonian, now uh, in Peru. Uh, but he and I uh, did like the two foot long hot dog challenge at Naughty Dog one year. Wow. Yeah. Ooh, wow. We like fasted for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds rough. Um, and then wow. I think, where was the other one? Buffalo. In Buffalo, yes. Cliff Murphy and I had mm. a Ted's hot dog, and he was trying to get me to give a hot dog Ted's, the Ted's hot dog talk. That's Ted awesome. Talk. Oh my god. The Ted talk. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Cliff. AFS Cliff hot dogs Cliff. of the Cliff past. Is, Cliff and his dad jokes have taken a year off my life. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, thank you so much for being on the show and spending time with us talking about everything from Fallout 76 to pies to hot dogs to imagining what the visionary folklore of our future looks like. You're just a rock star and we really appreciate you making time for us and this has been so much fun yeah thank you all so much yeah it was um, very fun we are gonna... and now i know how to how to use discord so i'll be back oh yeah although oh, my I God. See next time i'll be on the twitch oh Ooh. yeah or like or if you see somebody a friend uh jay williams come on the show um <laughs> play fallout 76 with me if you see a friend uh, who's gonna be on the show and you want to just like decide to you know, Discord bomb them in our chat. You now can oh, yes. do that. Yeah, you, you can, can do that. Right. And just yes. be like, hi. <laughs>